At this point, I'd like to turn to the item four uh, on our program, the Brooklyn Port Revitalization. Uh, <clears throat> Vice Chairman and former Congressman Joe Diagotti for the Nadler Long Task Force. Joe? <clears throat> Thank you, Maurice. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is uh, delightful to see a group of people uh, coming together, labor, business, political figures, to resolve in a non-partisan way a crisis that this area faces. Uh, my claim to fame is not just as a former congressman. Would you believe I'm the only practicing certified public accountant ever elected to Congress in 221 years? Uh, <clears throat> and by the way, there are 276 attorneys. Imagine a place with 276 lawyers and no accountant. That's Congress. And we want to know why we can't balance anything. Everybody's spending, nobody's counting. Joe has a book on the subject in case you want. To. Unaccountable Congress, it doesn't add up. In any case, I was delighted about two years ago to meet Jerry Nadler personally. Uh, my history in Congress is evident. If you looked at my record, I always reached to the other side of the aisle to find smart <coughs> members of the other party, to put together caucuses and task forces to see whether we could solve national and regional problems in a bipartisan or nonpartisan manner. I did it with the Long Island Sound in getting Mr. Morazic and Mr. Morrison together with me, and we cleaned up that body of Water, and I reached out to Mr. Torricelli in creating a task force for the Hudson River, and we began to resolve the problems of the PCBs. That was back in 85, 86, 87. So when one day uh, my uh, friend and constituent, Sal Catucci, the operator of the Brooklyn Container Port, and let's call it what it is, believe it or not, we've got a full-fledged, well-developed Brooklyn Container Port. You don't see the signs like you see up in Albany. I don't know why the Port Authority is trying to hide it, but we've got a Brooklyn Container Port with a channel that's deeper than the channel already that exists in New Jersey. And this is what this is all about, besides a few other things I'm about to tell you. Thomas Jefferson said, information is the currency of democracy. All we're trying to do is inform the public officials, the press, the public, so that we can get some real change and fast. And if we don't get it fast, we are going to lose because this is not a New Jersey problem and this is not a New York problem. It's a regional port problem and Halifax and Norfolk are already set up to take in these big ships you've been hearing about and we're sitting here going obsolete every day if we don't do what you're hearing. So let me give you the bottom line of this task force because when I met Jerry, I met someone who really impressed me. I'm impressed by all kinds of people who are smart, hardworking, dedicated, and I realized that with the governorship changing from a Democrat to a Republican, here we had a very bright, experienced individual spending 15 years as an assemblyman understanding the infrastructure. He's telling me things I didn't know, and I says, Jerry, we got to get you plugged into the power. And I got to somehow get you plugged into Republicans who need your knowledge and your energy. And that's where the idea for the task force came. I then reached out to my friend, Mike Long. Obviously, when you put together a task force with the co-chairman being the chairman of the conservative party and Jerry Nadler, you're sending a strong signal, I believe, that this is nonpartisan. I hope that's the signal we've sent. Because the, as they call themselves the odd couple, they don't agree with anything, not even the baseball team in New York, but they, they agree on one thing, jobs, economic, viability for New York and undoing what the public sector and the politicians may have done, and I'm not going to blame one party, let's say both sides of the aisle to be fair, in the last 20 to 30 years. Now let's talk about what's created the problem we have and let's talk about why we have a solution that's in progress. And Maurice, thank you for being on the executive committee of our task force and John McHugh is on that executive committee. I see several members here because it's important that our ad hoc task force, which has no real power, except that we plug information in to the right people and we try to move the agenda. But having you, Maurice, as an active member, we're plugged into your Business Labor Community Council, and I think this is the way we're gonna get done. I see Ed Patarello here too, who's on the task force. So let me tell you what's happened as a businessman. I spent 22 years with Arthur Anderson. That's a good experience when you meld it with four years in Congress. I'm now an active citizen and I may be back in public office, but let's put that off. Number one, <laughs> number one, we have built this region's economy on a failed vision. The vision was 
white collar jobs. We didn't see that technology, especially the uh, betterment of the computer business, would allow ATT, IBM, 9X to downsize. So somewhere along the line, somebody made a decision years ago that New York City and the region would benefit by pulling that market niche even stronger into the New York area. And as we can see, it's crumbling before us. It doesn't exist anymore, a future based on white collar jobs. At the same time, if you go along the Brooklyn waterfront, as I've been taken by Congressman Nadler and Sal Catucci and others, you see devastation, you see deterioration, you see World War II, Berlin after World War II, rotting piers, empty warehouses, incredible <coughs> miles of you know, property that is not dedicated to anything. And now we've got community groups thinking, wouldn't it be nice to put parks there? Wouldn't it be nice to build buildings there? when we may need a portion of that property to fulfill the economic potential of this region, certainly New York. So that's one thing that has happened. Number two things, that, uh, two things that's happened in terms of technology. We saw it coming, but we never realized it would come this fast. Just a month ago, Maersk Lines announced it will introduce a ship into this area that will be the equivalent, I guess what they call it is 6,000 TEUs. That's 20 foot container equivalents. That's 6,000 20 foot containers. Containers are bigger, they may be 40, but that's the, the, the thing. That draws 50 feet. That ship will not be able to come into New York Harbor. And that ship is coming pretty soon. Now, if that's not bad enough, just a few weeks ago, I was out at the container port, Red Hook, um, American Stevedoring Inc., the operator. Um, I was talking to Mr. Catucci, and I looked out the window, and I saw this huge ship. I said, Sal, I've never seen a ship this big. It was Hogue Lines. He says, Joe, would you believe that ship cannot go into Newark or, or Port Elizabeth? It has to come here on high tide. And then again, about a week or two ago, a ship called the Senator came in. And Sal was telling me that ship came in here. It almost went to Halifax, but since we're aggressive, we got it to stop off here. It's going to unload 100 containers, high tide, and then it's going to Newark. So it's happening already. The technology of the shipping industry has changed to the point where we already are obsolete. Let me go through this third point in the technology. Years ago, people were conditioned to believe you need 2,000 acres to have a container port. No, look at Hong Kong. Look at the article that appeared in the Wall Street Journal last September that we sent to uh, Christine Whitman. It said that you can conduct a full-fledged container port on less than 400 acres. Why? Today, they don't go just one, two, or three. They can pile containers 10 high. It's a different technology in running a port. And if you have efficient operators like we have in Brooklyn, you can easily, easily create a mature container port automatically. Number four, dredging. This is the thing that's driving the system. Why? Because it's the burr under every politician's saddle, whether it's Jersey or Albany. The courts have shut down the dredging operation. Why? Well, when I was in Congress, they used to measure dioxins part per billion. Parts per billion. Now it's parts per trillion. And we have a very active environmentalist uh, uh, coalition uh, that's keeping the, uh, uh, the watch on what's going on. And now you have some of the most contaminated silt in the world right there in New Jersey. Now there's something else that we didn't realize, at least I didn't realize, maybe you knew it, and I didn't. You know, some things we have to attribute to Mother Nature and God. Right off of Brooklyn, you have a 45-foot natural channel. It hardly silts in. Below that 45 feet, you have 15 feet of relatively uncontaminated material, sand. So you don't hit rock until you go down to 60 feet. Guess what happens in a Kilvan Cull? Right now, you've got a maximum on high tide, 42 feet. You can dredge maybe another three to five, then you hit rock. Now it's no longer dredging, it's blasting. The Army Corps has informed us that if you blast too much into that narrow channel, you create an unstable channel. Now, what does this point to? It points to the fact that we have a regional problem. 
Jersey is not going to survive without New York, and New York is not going to survive without New Jersey. We're not trying to substitute the Brooklyn container port for Jersey. We're trying to look at this region, our task force, as a whole. And we're saying is if you want to compete with Halifax, if you want to compete with Norfolk, they've already got the channels, they've already done the clearances with the railroads, they've already got a tunnel. I don't want to get into that subject, but the Port Authority was founded in 1922 to do a tunnel. We still don't have it, and that's got to be looked at as well. What are we doing here? Fiddling while Rome burns? What is the City Planning Commission doing? What is the New York City Economic Development Council? What has it done? What's the Port Authority doing? It is the regional body that's supposed to be looking at this and balancing off both areas, and all we see is friction, whether it's the airports or the port. That's why it's important to have this Business Labor Community Council. That's why it's important to have this task force, because we have to hold their feet to the fire, not politically, but with information. You can fool some of the people some of the time, you can fool some of them all the time, but you can't fool all the people all the time. And as we put this information on the table, you will find that the answers will come out that we must now work together. Let me, um, I see Chris Ward. By the way, Maurice, Mike Long, as you know, is in Albany. Uh, Sal Catucci is meeting as we speak with the Port Authority. He is a wonderful advocate for getting the Port Authority to keep its pledge on both sides of the harbor. But I do see Chris Ward. Are you back there, Chris? Yeah. Good. Why don't you sit up here, Chris, because we have a true expert with us. Chris uh, handled many of these issues uh, when he was one of the top officials at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. He is now working with American Steve Adoring, Inc. He attended the meeting a couple of weeks ago that the task force managed to have with the governor's office and Mike Finnegan. And yes, we brought Jerry Nadler there to see Mr. Finnegan so that we can allow him personally, he flew up to Washington, to make his case about the draft situation. And let's expand a little bit on what Carolyn Maloney said. Jerry has come up with a very creative idea, and he's already run it by some of the community groups, or at least the environmental groups, and uh, we don't see any, when you look at the two alternatives, the dredging problems in Jersey versus the dredging problems here, you see that there's almost an immediate answer here. Uh, many of you may know what the Atlantic Basin is. Uh, it's, it's kind of like a big, deep area between two piers, and it can take a lot of fill. Now, we're not experimenting with this. Already in the state of Washington, they have perfected these so-called on-land capping things with, with contaminated soil. We may not have to start with Jersey soil. Why not begin with the 15 feet that's off of Brooklyn, put that over bulkheads just like they've done in the state of Washington, and create a much larger pier than we have there already? Why not then take that concept and go along the Belt and the Gowanus and see where we can do it, consistent with what the community feels it needs for other uses? Obviously, we've got to deal with the land use problem. One of the things that we hope to announce shortly, I don't want to be the one to, uh, uh, to, uh, to beat Mr. Gargano and his, his announcements, but I think we're going to find a very uh, supportive Empire State Development Corporation, and I believe shortly we're going to be able to do a study funded by them on where the Brooklyn Container Port should be, how big should it be, how does it complement the other land uses that are there, and this task force has only been a year in existence, and already you could see the articles that we've gotten in the Daily News, and finally, finally, the New York Times decides to put one of our articles in, and we've been sending them information for over six months. Uh, as I said, it's a nonpartisan thing, so I don't understand and why anybody would hold back that information from the public, and this is a step in the right direction. So let's hope that as a result of this meeting, as a result of the meeting that we're going to have shortly, Maurice and Ed and John, we haven't had a meeting of our task force in two months because we wanted to be able to announce some important things which we are about to have and announce uh, so that we can all work together and uh, get this thing uh, off and going. I think it's important that we understand the problem of the New York region. It's jobs, jobs, 
jobs. Obviously, it's taxes too, but uh, you know, as you lose infrastructure, as you lose business, as you downsize, you hurt your rateables, and then you have to spread the tax base across just the fewer people that remain. Uh, that's what's going on in Westchester County, Dutchess and Putnam, where I come from. That's what's going on here. It's a formula for disaster. We have to be able to intercept the politicians and get them focusing on the intermediate and the long-term problems. Sure, we got to deal with the short term. No question about it. But there's very little consideration being given, as far as I can see, to these longer range problems. And having spent four years in Washington, I know that they don't get elected by solving long term problems. Joe. This is the reason that we have to get together here. Yeah, all right. I, we have a number of other speakers on this okay. subject. I want to thank, thank you for your input and your energy and your leadership. The short term program that we want to address and focus on is the potential for dredging in the Brooklyn port area, the kind of references that uh, Joe Diagardi has made. We have with us Peter Scherf, who is with the Commonwealth Group, who is part of the private sector, who knows what's going on in the private sector, and have him give us this year's program, this year and next year's program, as seen from the people who operate these port facilities, that know the dredging and containment uh, projects, that can indicate to us what jobs can be made. Part of the address of this group is addressed to such people on the City Planning Commission who are with us today in the long-term planning uh, department of the City Planning Commission, Sandy Hornick, who's sitting in the back and I hope taking notes, since his boss, Joe Rose, has been known to make statements that make <laughs> the work uh, of our business labor community coalition all the more difficult because the notion that we have that there are jobs available in the seaport and the container port is a real vital facility for the port of New York is something that Mr. Rose, as his chairman of the as chairman of the City Planning Commission, has alluded to as being pie in the sky. Uh, Peter Scherf. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I actually I think we'll give a little more of a macro picture of the overall sort of shipping trends. Our business, we are consultants and brokers to the container ship industry, um, which we are very proud to say, and it's good to be here today, because on Friday night we celebrated uh, till almost till midnight the 40th anniversary of the sailing of the first container ship, which sailed from Newark to Houston on April 26, 1956, carrying 58 containers. And as Mr. Deguardi mentioned, Maersk Line now have a ship of 6,700 containers, TEUs. Uh, sailing the seas. There are more of these coming. Um, the container ship industry, um, the, the trend is for more and more bigger ships. The trend is for alliances between major companies. The major carriers such as Maersk have aligned themselves with Sealand. Uh, other leading American companies such as American President Lines have formed global alliances with the Japanese carriers, with the European carriers. Um, and with Hong Kong based carriers. So we're seeing a sense of a conglomerate of about 40 of the largest companies forming into alliances of say five or six uh, large groups. These companies are building large ships and invariably when there are five or six of these partners there's almost a sort of lemming effect and if one goes and orders four or five large ships then so do the others so that they have 20 or 30 of these large ships. These ships are, it, it is, if you haven't seen one, it, it's sort of hard to believe their size. They're about 1,000 feet long. Um, they draw in water anywhere from 44 to 50 feet when they are fully laden. Um, it, it's uncertain how much bigger they will get. Certainly, I mean, the test is going to be these new mask ships of over 6,000 TEUs. Um, what these ships do, though, is they cost somewhere between fifty and sixty thousand dollars a day for the owners to operate. The owners want to keep the ships moving. The, the concept is speed. These ships are about twenty-four knots, um, which is between ten and twenty percent higher than the average speed was uh, for such ships four years ago. Um, they need to keep the ships at sea and moving. Therefore we get very focused on this sort of hub and feeder concept. In the long term, 
20, 30 years down the road, we may be looking at one North Atlantic port, one South Atlantic port. How does the cargo get fed down? If, if you go to Singapore or Hong Kong and you're feeding into Southeast Asia, you feed with smaller container ships. These are foreign flag container ships that can trade to all these multi-ports. But in the States, we have something called the Jones Act, which in spite of efforts by the Jones Act Reform Coalition is still on the books, is probably likely to stay on the books for a while. The Jones Act means that it has to, any ships calling coastwise have to be American flagships. And there are basically no suitable American flag feeder ships. So all the feeding has to be done by rail. And, and as far as this group is concerned, the emphasis on developing the port and uh, springing forward a strong hub feeder concept out of Brooklyn is based on the ability to develop a very strong rail link. Norfolk has one, Halifax has one, most of the other East Coast ports have one, and they will drive business, they will gain business at the expense of New York and Brooklyn if they can provide that. So that is really the key. In overall size, the, the New York container market grew about 9% last year. If you exclude military cargo, it's the 20th largest port in the world. If you include military cargo, it's the 11th largest port in the world. So uh, there's a lot at stake, but, it, but it's rail which is needed more than the ships. The ships are going to get bigger and are going to focus on one port. Um, and it needs the, the coalition of labor and business to bring it together. Thank you, uh, Wally. We have with us also Captain uh, Dean of the Sandy Hook Pilots. I'm Wally. Wally Shapiro? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Peter Schiff, you thought. Uh, no, no, I... Uh, we said Peter. thank you, Wally. <laughs> Did I say? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Peter. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I didn't even know Wally until he waved his hand. <laughs> I didn't know Wally was here. Thank you, Wally <laughs> Shapiro, for being here. Uh, it may have been uh, subliminal. Uh, in any event, uh, Captain Dean, the Sandy Hook pilots. The interesting point before I uh, just let um, uh, Captain Dean go forward, the thing we're trying to stress here is that we're bringing to the table, to this conference, people who are in the private sector, who know what they're doing, who uh, their business is the port, and who understand the linkage between the port and the rail and the harbor estuary and the dredging. These are the elements that people have been unable to integrate. And thank you for coming, uh, Captain Dean. Uh, thank you for inviting us. Uh, San Diego pilots have been in uh, service of uh, supplying pilotage for the Port of New York and New Jersey for over 302 years. Uh, we were asked to uh, come to the task force in New York, the Siemens Church, a couple of months ago, and we talked about the Port of Brooklyn. The Port of Brooklyn, right now, from Al's Head to 33rd Street, Brooklyn, is naturally 40 feet deep. Red Hook has taken a lot of the larger deep draft vessels that cannot go over to Bayonne and also to Port Newark because of draft. Dredging is a major concern for the ports of New York and New Jersey. I have in Perth Amboy a channel that's supposed to be 35 feet deep. It has shoaled to 32 feet, 5 inches. We have to have it dredged. It hasn't been dredged since 1993. And with this shoaling uh, occurring, that means that less draft for tankers and chemical vessels to go into the terminals behind Staten Island will not be able to get there. Yeah. When we talked about the Port of Brooklyn from 33rd Street to Al's Head. It's, uh, it's a diamond in the rough. It's an hour and a half for a ship to get to Brooklyn in that area. It's 14.5 miles versus 21 miles to go up to Port Newark or Port Elizabeth. It's a three hour turnaround in order to get up to Port Newark and Port Elizabeth versus the hour and a half. I was born in Brooklyn on 48th Street in Norwegian Hospital. I lived in Fort Hamilton all my life. These piers 20 years ago were break bulk piers and they created a lot of jobs and a lot of vessels went there. As time goes by, shipping changes. We went into containerization. Those piers now have been on fire. They're falling down. 
That area could be bulkheaded. The contaminated material, the category number three material, could be put behind that bulkheaded area. You could charge Port Newark and Port Elizabeth if they can get 117 or 127 dollars to send stuff to Utah. You could get 65 to 70 dollars for tipping fees alone just to put the category number three material behind this bulkhead. It would probably be cost efficient. The area now is falling down. I think it would give a good, good burst of in, uh, a financial influx into that Bay Ridge area and create jobs. Rail, I understand there's the, uh, the harbor carriers can go over to Bayonne. Uh, the Long Island Railroad, I heard somebody speak about the Long Island Railroad. We have a, we have a natural uh, means to be able to go over the Hellgate Railroad Bridge and up into the Northeast and go as far as Maine. Maybe we can compete with Halifax. If the New York area wants to be a major port, we have to do something in Brooklyn and do the dredging in Port Newark and Port Elizabeth. Otherwise, all of the ships are going to go to Halifax. And the Canadians are going to be very happy with us because they can put it on a rail and they can send all of our parts to our cars and our cars can come out of Detroit and Chicago, which should be American jobs on American rail. So we have to do something. And I'm very interested in participating in anything that I can do to help. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Dean. Wallace Shapiro, for a few words, you're in, on this panel here. Good morning. Thank you for, to the committee for inviting me here to say a few words. Speak uh, into the mic, please. I'm a small business owner in the Red Oak area. I've been there since 1960 myself, and we are opportunist to the Red Hook Pier. Uh, I just wanted to uh, make comment about one thing. I have to get something I left in my folio. One second. Are there questions while he's getting his folio? Yes. I don't know if anybody in the room has fanned through the Port Authorities via Port of New York magazine that I received last week, but there was a great advertisement sponsored by American Steve Doring and Sal Catucci that uh, it's a promo for Red Hook, okay? Very positive, very optimistic. I'm very close to this pier. And uh, a lot of my cargo, being in the public warehouse and bonded uh, warehouse business, uh, originates from the Red Hook Terminal. I personally see an increase in the projected need for ancillary services and supportive zoning to promote the development of these services in the Red Hook area. Uh, Joe DeGuardi before mentioned that he was in favor of undoing community harm to the Red Hook industrial community. I'm very much in favor of taking a very serious look at the current wave that's going on in the area right now. I'm in favor because of the increased projection of uh, the development of jobs in Red Hook. And I think that this is going to be just a normal spinoff. Uh, we're here to promote industry and growth in the Red Hook area, and also to promote growth in the private sector for services in Brooklyn in general. Uh, referring back to the previous speaker, I too was a, a businessman in Red Hook and in Brooklyn, and I saw the activity that used to take place on the waterfront, and it's a far cry from what it used to be. Uh, also echoing Joe uh, Diogardi's comment about cautioning the New York City Planning Commission not to take any actions that might stifle the development of ancillary services in the immediate Red Hook area. Also echoed by uh, Congresswoman's uh, comment about the uh, Hugo uh, budget with the uh, Rolls-Royce uh, requirements. <coughs> I want to thank the committee and the, the uh, group here for inviting me here to say a few words and uh, tell you that I'd be looking forward to any communications that might be forthcoming and participating in any way that I can. Thank you very much.